All right, my beautiful people, man. Good evening. Good evening to you all. Uh, thanks so much for joining, man. New Black Wall Street. Oh, I got to get my Instagram going. Give a little bit of time. Let Instagram or Facebook know that we're here. We'll get this thing started, man. We got a um, series that we're going to be starting today, which I'm super excited about, which is... Uh, which is... The uh, Black History portion. So, um, I'm excited about that. Let's see if I can find the right thing on Instagram. How you guys doing, by the way, man? Hopefully, everybody's doing well. That's cool. All these little filters on Instagram. Nope, don't want that one. Oh, that's cool. Yep, I'll do that. All right, let's do that. All right. Who's with us, man? Go ahead and let us know that you're here. Good evening, good evening. Man, we got some rain going on here. All right, there we go. Back history series. All right, so we are good here, I think. There we go. What's going on, man? Eric Lumpkin, man. What's up? what's up with you, brother? How you doing? Good evening to you, Jennifer Alvin. Thanks so much for joining. Um, and those that actually join us here tonight, man, go ahead and put a comment on Black History. We're starting a, a new series, and I know I don't finish all the series we start all the time, but I thought that this was such a wonderful time for us to do this, especially being in this this month. So I'm going to actually take on a daunting task of kind of going through three books at a time because each book is kind of different in its, uh, in its I guess you could say, its breakdown. So I'll share with you those books in just a second. New Black Wall Street Book Club, where black folk do read. Uh, if you put it in the book, we absolutely will find it. Also want you guys to know that, uh, you know, check out our new page, which is ERGJ TV. Uh, go to that page, like that page, follow that page, because eventually all of this content will be there. We just want to make sure we give people enough time to know that we are moving. Uh, most of our video content that we create, our live content, will be on ERGJ TV, which is a Facebook page uh, that you can find on Facebook. So ERGJ TV, ERGJ TV. Well, I'm not going to delay. Uh, we're going to get right to this thing here tonight. Y'all know what time it is. Mr. DJ, hit the music. New, new, new black, new, new black. Wall Street Book Club, Evan Jefferson, brother, much love. Educating, elevating, because and knowledge is the power, and we'll never give it up. <laughs> Literature is for the masses. Where to put your money down, now how to watch your assets. Yeah, uplifting others is a passion. My brother Evan, he will turn it into action. New Black Wall Street Book Club, you should come read with come us. us. Yeah, we comprehend and discuss. Yeah. We all just come together, there's no limit for there's us. No limit for us. <laughs> It comes your host, New Black Wall Street. Evan, take it away. New Black Wall Street. <laughs> New Black Wall Street Book Club. All right, my beautiful people, man. Thanks so much for joining us here tonight on the New Black Wall Street Book Club, where black folk do read. If you put in the book, we absolutely will find it. I'm your host, ERGJ, your certified financial educator, CEO of ERGJ Enterprises, ERGJ Black Bazaar, and international best selling author of the book, The Black Billionaires Club. Uh, that book there is a study of black wealth. That book there is a study of the 12 richest black people in the world today and how they built their wealth. And I just truly believe that if you want to be wealthy, that's a big if, by the way. But if you do, I recommend that you study wealthy people. So you can find that book by simply going to the website, theblackbillionersclub.com. That's right, theblackbillionersclub.com. Pick up your copy today. Hit the like button, the share button. And if you care, like button, share button. If you care, let people know that we're here. Uh, I was uh, actually uh, doing a... a, a, a I guess a little quick stream earlier this morning, and I was like, it's so it's so impactful to see black men or black folk reading, and so we got to keep this thing going on. So tonight, um, guys, I wanted to, uh, it's kind of the the introduction or the beginning of our new series, which is all about black history. We've got three different books I'll be sharing with you guys, uh, and we'll go through maybe the introduction, maybe the first chapter of each one. I'm not quite sure how much time we have, uh, but we'll try to do that. Do want your help though, guys. We're still looking to get to a thousand subscribers for our YouTube channel, which is ERGJ Enterprises. Uh, so go ahead and go to ERGJ Enterprises, hit the uh, follow button or the subscribe button on YouTube 
ERGJ Enterprises helps us out a whole lot. Um, and so black history, guys. So I found three books and I'm going to share with you guys those books and we will get into them. At least we'll go through the introductions. And if we have time, we'll go through and read each, each first chapter of those books. But the first one I want to introduce to you guys is called African American Inventions That Changed the World. African American Inventions That Changed the World. So this is a book. Whew. Oh, there we go. This is a book written by uh, uh, by, written by a man named Michael A. Carson. African American Inventions That Changed the World. He's got about roughly, well, I don't know how many, maybe a hundred different inventors. I'm not quite sure. It's just a book filled with different ones. So uh, this is the book we'll be going through. So what I'll do is each episode, I'll read uh, Inventor, and then we'll get into our second book, which is by Mr. Dr. Claude Anderson. Wrote a book called A Black History Reader, which is 101 questions you never thought to ask. 101 questions that you never thought to ask. So we'll go through one of those questions every episode. And then the book that I really was like, man, I, I can't wait to dig into this is a book by Mr. Dick Gregory. Uh, it's called Defining Moments in Black History, Reading Between the Lives. So this is going to be our main text that we'll be going through when we read together. Uh, but the other two will just be kind of some supportive uh, you know, things that we can use to kind of be our appetizer, get us get ourselves going uh, each time that we get together. So we'll start with the African-American inventions that change the world. We'll read the introduction and we'll, I guess, read the first, uh, you know, uh, African-American inventor and what he did. So Michael Carson wrote this book, Introduction. Let's read. It said a considerable amount of the world's most influential inventors, inventors have been African American, which is a fact that is often overlooked. The fact that is often overlooked. Let's see if I can find this again. Okay. Throughout history, African American inventors have played a pivotal role in creating revolutionary inventions that have impacted our lives in various ways. These pioneers have contributed to the fields of medicine, agriculture, science, and technology, to name a few. In the 1800s, many of those in innovators were born into slavery and were not allowed to acquire the formal education. They were faced with countless obstacles and had to triumph over many adverse conditions. Nevertheless, these inventors have made significant contributions to the world. African Americans, men and women, have left their mark in both American and world history. Many of their innovation, innovative creations could not, would not exist today if it wasn't for their brilliant minds and creative ideas. The incredible inventors mentioned in this book have collectively created over 500 inventions. They represent some of the amazing men and women who have impacted our lives throughout their intel intelligence and ingenuity. So we will uh, pick up his first inventor uh, that he uh, that he speaks about in this book, African American Inventions That Changed the World. And he points out George Washington Carver. George Washington Carver, everybody put in comments on GWC. Now, I'm pretty sure many of us know who George Washington Carver is, but maybe there's some things about George Washington Carver that we don't know. George Washington Carver, his inventions. George Washington Carver was born an artist, college educator, chemist, botanist, and the man who raised the peanut and soybean to cash crops to help save the South, South farming economy. He issued bulletins to farmers explaining how growing peanuts instead of cotton was better for the nutrients in the soil. He also developed hundreds of uses from peanuts, including soap, axle grease, insecticides, glue, medicines, and charcoal, to name a few. Contrary to popular belief, he did not invent peanut butter. For all his research and the council, Ms. Carver only patented three of his peanut inventions. He was not interested in fame or fortune. All of what he was able to produce from peanuts led to it becoming one of the six most produced crops in the United States by the 1940s. Uh, Carver's revolutionized agriculture in the South, transforming its economy. United States Postal Service honored Carver on a poster stamp in 1948 and 1998. He also inducted, he was also inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame in 1990. So George Washington Carver. He was uh, born in 1864, uh, and, and he, uh, he passed away in 1943. His background. George Washington Carver, birth date is unknown. He was born in Diamond Grove, Missouri in 1864 to enslaved parents. He was orphaned at an infant and raised by the owners of a plantation. 
Growing up, he discovered his love for plants and nature, and he was determined to pursue an education to learn more about them. Carver was later adopted by foster parents. They allowed him to attend school. He studied hard and years later graduated from high school. He was the first African-American accepted into Iowa Agricultural College, where he studied botany. And in 1896, Booker T. Washington recruited Carver to teach botany at Tuskegee's Institute, Institute's Agricultural School. During his train ride from Iowa to Alabama, Carver noticed the entire South badly needed a new agricultural technique. He discovered all of the farmland and was worn out due to only growing cotton each year. This was very damaging to the soil and, and drained its nutrients. He began teaching his students a new groundbreaking method of crop rotation. His invention, Carver advised all farmers to plant cotton one year, then peanuts and sweet potatoes the following year. South, Southern farmers followed his lead to great success. He also famously developed more than 300 uses for peanuts, from ink to hand lotion to cooking oil. In 1942, Franklin D. Roosevelt left Washington, D.C. to visit Tuskegee Institute's campus to personally greet Carver and applaud his remarkable research. Carver also revolutionized the soybean. He developed more than 100 uses from soybeans, from plastics to adhesives, in 1942, Carver taught automotive pioneer Henry Ford how to construct a new line of automobile parts using plastic that was produced from soybeans. Carver and Ford became close friends. With Carver's advice, Ford created over a 7,000-acre 7, soybean farm in Michigan. What's going on, cleaning crew over YouTube, man? Thanks so much for joining us. Yvette Goodrich, thanks so much for joining us. Ms. Kinata Downer, good, morning. good evening to you. Ms. Felicia Gardner, thanks so much for joining So. Our inventor of the day or, uh, from African-Americans to who, uh, inventions that changed the world, George Washington Carver. You guys are familiar with him, but there are going to be many in this book that you may not be familiar with. And so we'll go through this uh, as we continue along in our series in the Black History series. Now, our second reading is a book written by Mr. Dr. Claude Anderson. Right. So you guys may be familiar with white labor. Black Labor, White Wealth. You might be familiar with Powernomics. Uh, those were the books that uh, George Washington Carver, but you, uh, Dr. Claude Anderson, but which you may not be familiar with, is he wrote a book on black history or history itself, which includes black folk. So this is called A Black History Reader. And it's 101 questions you never thought to ask. And so we're going to go through its introduction. And, oh, I actually got a signed copy, by the way. It's signed. <laughs> I'm going to go through his introduction and then his first question that you may never thought to ask as it relates, I guess, to history. Okay? So we'll do that. So his introduction, or is this introduction, a black history reader, a black history reader. Let's read. Within a nation that perceives itself as the world's greatest superpower, Worldwide police force and a home from all immigrants seeking the so-called American dream, black Americans are a forgotten people who remain in, in an impoverished outgroup and an abandoned labor class. After nearly 500 years of institutionalized slavery, Jim Crow semi-slavery, public policies of benign neglect and political correctness, blacks are consigned to the lowest level of this nation's ranking order of social acceptability. In this book, I try to answer the question, why? Everybody put in the comments below, why? I tried to answer the question, why? In coming to an understanding of the fixed position of Black America at the bottom of the well, we must first come to terms with what has changed and what has not changed in race matters, especially in urban areas, immigration, economics, and other aspects of policy in the United States. The internal strength of the country is connected to the fate of Blacks, a significant population group within the country. There are mutual benefits for mainstream society and Black Americans to fully understand the nature of the black dilemma. Although race is an uncomfortable and almost taboo topic, for those who truly want black people to be a self-sufficient group in American society, race must be examined. But any examination must be based on an understanding of history and facts. In all my books, my goal has been to clarify the issue of race for the purpose of corrective action. That is also the case in this book, A Black History Reader. The purpose of A Black History Reader is threefold. One, the first purpose is to present to the reader the nation's constitution-based social construct that historically established and fixed the racial relationship between blacks and whites. The constitution was the first nation's first affirmative action plan. It assured the mild distribution of nearly 100% of the nation's wealth and resources in the hands of whites, 
who subsequently bequeathed their unearned wealth, power, rights, privileges, and resources into the hands of succeeding generations of whites. Contrarily, the descendants of slaves were left impoverished and powerless. This constitution-based disparity between blacks and whites was kept intact by the U.S. Supreme Court, the chief guardian of racism, and other courts, educational institutions, conservative ideology, and extra-legal activities of groups such as the Ku Klux Klan, or the White Citizens Council, and the modern-day Freedom Party. The second purpose of this book is to declare the exceptionality of the descendants of slaves in America, their unique and substantive, sub, substan, substantive contributions to the development of this country and their maltreatment by all segments of society. Their exceptionality distinguishes them from any other group in America. And the third purpose of this book is to highlight the acute need in black America for long overdue reparations based on the exceptionality of the war, of the way their group has been viewed and treated. In our journey toward, for, in our journey forward, Native Black Americans must be recognized, compensated, and put into a protected class like Native Americans. It is my hope that this book of and Power Nam is the National Plan to Empower Black America will inspire new thinking from which will grow a more conscious class of Black leadership that will design and assert a new transformative social construct, including a new black code of conduct that puts the interests of blacks foremost. A new social construct will require society to unlearn prevailing myths, lies, assumptions, and distortions about blacks, whites, racism, and political correctness. This shift will not come easily. It will be met with pushback by mainstream society and many in the black overclass, which is made up of black civil rights leaders, ministers, and elected officials. Newly trained thinkers who understand poweronomics principles and strategies will design a new social construct on race that will replace social integration and civil rights. From these new thinkers should arise new black leadership who will produce a new legal infrastructure in which blacks are included as system beneficiaries, guide the black masses to building functioning black economic communities, set up black independent political parties, and assert the value of black lives. A black history reader explains how racism became embedded into our national culture and offers a new direction. It explains how the overt racism that was expressed in slavery progressed through Jim Crow segregation and became submerged and replaced by benign neglect and political correctness policies that continue to demonstrate hateful indifference towards black people. The purpose and net effect of these two policies rendered blacks invisible and irrelevant. The Black Civil Rights Movement, though well-intentioned, saw integration, integration based on the assumption that all people were equal. Equality of the races was not intended under the Constitution. Blacks were designed, designated specifically as a laboring class of property to be controlled by the dominant white society. Consequently, Blacks have never been able to acquire more than one half of 1% of the nation's wealth or anything of value. Even after Blacks acquired voting rights without wealth or political influence, their votes were easily rendered null and void. National immigration policy kept Blacks as, only, as the only permanent minority within a society where the majority wins and the minority loses. Blacks are now a permanent minority in every respect. For example, in two important sectors, politics and business ownership, Blacks represent less than one half of 1% of the nation's elected officials, and are less than one half of 1% of the nation's business owners. These historical conditions are not accidental. They reflect the enduring quality of the design and the founding social construct on race that was confided, codified in the Constitution. These Constitution-based race disparities allow whites to dominate and control blacks in all respects throughout the centuries. Although blacks were intended to be at the bottom, that status can be changed if Blacks and our society truthfully assess the circumstances, create it, and have the courage and fortitude to take the necessary steps prescribed in this and many and my other works. The goal of my collective work is for Black Americans to become self-sufficient and a competitive as a group. And a Black history reader all for Black Americans and others who seek true racial justice, a way to build a future in which the unique history and socioeconomic needs of Black Americans are considered. I invite you to join me in that quest. Begin reading now then do the right things. What's going on, Hakeem? How you doing, man? Thanks so much for joining me. It's Vivian Reed. Again, a Black History Reader, a book written by Mr. Dr. Claude Anderson. 
Uh, let's go into his first question. So this is 101 questions that you never thought to ask, and this is all about history, okay? It's all about history, right? And once we learn history, right, once we understand and learn history, then we can uh, use it to change our future. So question number one that he writes, the author, what is a social construct and how was it used in the making of America? What is a social construct and how was it used in the making of America? So a, co a social construct is a, a purposely created idea, a purposely created idea developed by one group with authority that defines another group with lesser or no authority. A social construct frames the perception of and the relationship between the groups. It becomes part of the culture, infused into the social norms and practices of every part of society, including legal, educational, financial, political, and interpersonal relationships. The most important social construct in America is race. The founding fathers purposely constructed the societal position of blacks and whites. Blacks were to be property that served whites, and whites were to be the only beneficiaries of the new century or the new country that they created. Christopher Columbus discovered the new land that was to be America in the same time frame that the Pope declared that blacks from Africa should be made slaves. It was the promise of free land and free labor that fueled the rest of Europeans to settle the new land. To implement their plan for the free labor, Europeans designed a relationship between blacks and whites. The social construct on race was formally stated in the Articles of the Confederation and restated in the Constitution of the United States, as well as the first immigration laws. I'll discuss these documents later in his book. The social construct on race is the thread that weaves through black enslavement, U.S. Supreme Court rulings, laws, institutions, conservative and liberal ideologies, extra legal i.e. Ku Klux Klan activities and all aspects of the nation's culture. It is the fundamental, it is fundamental to the founding of our country that blacks would always be pressed to be uh, pressed to the bottom and that whites would always retain superiority over blacks. That relationship endures to this day. The social construct on race was deliberate and permanent. It is so fundamental to the issue of race that the topic cannot be considered in any serious way without understanding it. It is therefore the first question in this book. What is a social construct and how is it used in the making of America? So I think the important thing to take away from that is a, is, is a, is a purposely created idea, right? A purposely created idea and I would basically say use the word control. Everybody put in console hashtag control. A purposely created idea of control. All right. So that is uh, that's the introduction and the first question that comes out of this book. So again, we're going to have an inventor of the day for this uh, this series, which will be uh, again coming out of the book African Americans that uh, changed African American inventions that changed the world, and then we will have a question. Um, that goes over black history and help us understand why we are where we are today. Written by Mr. Do Dr. Claude Anderson, a black history reader. 101 questions you never thought to ask. 101 questions you never thought to ask. Now, our last book that we'll be reading out of, which is the meat of our gathering, will be Defining Moments in Black History, Reading Between the Lies. This is a book written by Mr. Dick Gregory, the late great Mr. Dick Gregory. Um, and uh, Martin Luther King III said this about Dick Gregory. <clears throat> Dick Gregory fearlessly speaks truth. The world we live in can only benefit from reading and sharing this important work with anyone who may have forgotten or is without comprehensive knowledge of true American history. So I believe Dick Gregory, what he's trying to do, he's saying, hey, it's not just black history. This is actually just American history and, uh, and blacks are involved in it. And so I don't know quite how far he's going to go back, but we're going to start with his introduction as well. And then we'll get into his first part, which is called Searching for Freedom. So his introduction might be a little long, so we might only get through the introduction. Yeah, we might not even get through all of that because this is pretty long. 
But I, but, but Dick Gregory is such a, 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 a dynamic brother. I can imagine we're going to be going on a ride here. So his introduction um, is called Dickology. Dickology for Dick Gregory. Um, nobody on the planet got nobody on the planet's got a better memory than a man who is illiterate. When he hits on a woman, since he can't write down her name, number, and address, he's got to memorize it. I guess that's a quote from Mr. Dick Gregory. Okay, fantastic. Let's read his introduction uh, and get uh, get uh, I don't know become familiar with this this book, defining moments in history, uh, reading between the lies. I wasn't always the smartest man in the room. On October 12th, they closed the schools. I thought they did it for my birthday since I was born on that day. It made me feel special. I didn't know anything about Columbus Day when I was coming up. I'm amused by that now, but what I've come to learn in my long life is that ignorance is not bliss. It is time consuming and costly as hell. Ignorance is not bliss. It is time consuming and costly as hell. Let me repeat that again. Oh, he's going to have some nuggets for us. Ignorance is not bliss. It is time consuming and costly as hell. Case in point, as a boy, I loved cowboy movies and went to see them three times a week. With the big show being on Sundays, I could relate to the cowboy because I saw my life in his. In every scene, he wore the same pair of boots, the same jacket, the same outfit. His shoes were not shined. His socks were not clean. I never saw him read a book, never saw him go to dinner. And I said, that's me. Cowboys were the, were the biggest sensation on the planet at the time. And I thought I was one of them. But reality quickly set in. After the movie was over I, and I was leaving, I walked through the alleys on my way home. I was embarrassed. Although the cowboys wore the same clothes and that made me feel comfortable in my poverty. I was not fully affirmed because I did not see any black cowboys in the movies. Once the movie was over, I was reminded that I was a poor black boy and I felt shame. My boyhood shame shaped my life and my beliefs. It made me recognize that you don't buy Rolls Royce and go back to the ghetto with it. You hang out where Rolls Royce people hang out. Why? Because you violate poor people with the very act of showing them what you have and reminding them of what is out of reach to them. Wow. <laughs> the people in the ghetto are driving around in 24-year-old Fords. If you bring a Rolls Royce around, you obviously embarrass them. That is one of the reasons I'm disturbed by some black ministers, those that flash their excess around their poor congregants and claiming it's a blessing from God. Why is God blessing only you? See, Catholic priests, no matter how much money they have, they all wear uniforms. No fancy clothes to make other folks feel bad about their own bargain basement clothing. If I had a church and a Rolls Royce, I would park six blocks away from the church and put on my robe. As I matured, I realized that poverty is nothing to be ashamed of. The way I see it, the poor make a sacrifice for the rich. But that's a whole other story. Although I felt bad after seeing the cowboy movies while I was watching them, I was transported. I've never seen, I've never been on a horse in my life, literally. I didn't have a horse, but I slapped my leg and say, giddy up, giddy up. And when my mama made me mad, I'd say, pow, and point my finger like it was a gun. After that, we were, what were the odds of me growing up and liking nonviolent Martin, Martin Luther King Jr.? As a boy, John Wayne was my hero. John Wayne didn't talk about nonviolence. If you're right and they're wrong, then kill them. That's what John Wayne said, and I love that. Then I had to rethink that whole thing when I got to know King. Now I look at John Wayne and say, you nasty, violent, ignorant somebody. That's why I say ignorance is not bliss, but costly. I did not understand the limits of violence. It took Martin Luther King to show me. And I didn't know that I shouldn't be ashamed of being poor either. But change in attitude does not come quickly. Put that in the comments below. Change in attitude does not come quickly. When I was in high school, I worked at the Shell gas station making more money than I ever had. One summer day, I, the weather was good. A few, other, a few of the other guys and I were talking trash and looking at some girls who were standing on the corner. I said, man, let's forget about work. And we skipped work for several days and hanging out with the girls. We didn't worry about it until it got close to payday. At the same time, we were kind of thinking that we might get fired since we hadn't shown up for work in days. We were scared to return. Sure enough, when we went back to work, the boss said to me, where you been? I lied and said, my mama died. 
Next thing I know, he came on over, started touching my shoulder, saying, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Oh, I'm just so sorry. He opened up his old worn-out leather wallet, took out a $10 bill, handed it to me, and said, just enjoy yourself, I said. Just enjoy yourself. I said, I came to get my check. He said, hold on. I'll get it for you. About six months later, same thing happened. This guy named Charles Simmons and I were just sitting outside talking trash to the girls, not thinking about going to work. Eventually, we went to go get our checks, and my white employer asked, where you been? I said, my mama died. He did the same thing as the previous time, patted me on my back and gave me money. At that moment, I knew that he was not really thinking about me. Learning that my boss did not sincerely care what was what an important lesson for me to learn early in life. I've not worked for anyone since. I've been on my own, making up my own, uh, making up my career as I go along. People call me an activist, social critic, comedian. Let's not forget conspiracy theorists. In this book, I have combined all of these talents to allow you to, us to look at American history differently. Part of my unique perspective was having been there. I was friends with the most with most of the people mentioned, and I stood next to some of the some of them during their greatest moments: Muhammad Ali, Michael Jackson, Rosa Parks, Angela Davis, Dr. King, Malcolm X, and so many more. Along with my activism, I spent my entire life in the pursuit of knowledge. Knowledge as it has meaning to me as a person of color. I appreciate all people, no matter their race, especially since we are we all involved evolved from the same stardust. But we must all be honest and recognize that the way black people see the world is quite different from how others see it, which is as it should be. One's race is more clearly defined by cultural practices and values than skin color. For instance, have you read those stories about people who are found dead at their jobs? One of those stories where they or the or one of those stories where they found a person kneeled over, head on his desk, and he was not discovered until the next day. I guarantee that would never be a black person. If black people feel like a little bit funny, like something ain't right in the air, in the air kind of funny, we're calling in sick. If it's looking like rain and you know what that does to our hairdo, we're thinking of calling in. If we ate too much at dinner and our clothes are too tight the next morning, we're not going to work. Many Caucasian people, on the other hand, love their work. At their jobs, they're affirmed and well compensated. They're given all the resources they need to make every day a good day. So it's no surprise that they love their work so much that they don't even want to retire. If I didn't work for myself, I would have retired a long time ago. I would still retire even though I know that about 100 years before I was born, black folks were qualified to do what I'm doing now, but they didn't get the chance. But seriously, other races have a different relationship to work because historically, they haven't been demeaned by it. And they most definitely have not been compensated for their labor. They most definitely have not been, and they most definitely have not been compensated for their labor. The earlier I got to work every day, the earlier I'd lose my dignity. And if I could find a reason to get off early, the sooner I'd get it back. In my pursuit of knowledge, throughout my more than 80 years on this planet, I've learned many interesting things, particularly about culture. Way, way back, lightning struck a pig barn. Know how rich you need to be to keep pigs in a barn. Well, two brothers, the sons of the barns, owner, ran out to the barn and saw that it was burning down. They smelled something they liked, barbecue. They started sniffing and said, damn, that stuff smells good. But check this out. Thousands of years passed before people realized that they could cook a pig without burning the barn down. That's how long it takes to undo a culture, a way that people do things that's been there forever, because that's how they've always done it. In fact, they think they'd be crazy to do it a different way. If your children were born in France and then you and your wife weren't around, what language did they speak? French, right? Well, language doesn't have a thing to do with human nature. With who you are as a person, it's culture. Everybody put it down, so hashtag culture. Wars are about culture. That's why you and I, if we live in the same country, can't have a war. The Civil War was about culture. The North didn't want the South to have slaves. If you go to Japan today, you can you read a Japanese sign? No, you can't. You think the universal God wanted something to change when you cross the border? You think God wanted the border to begin with? That's how the whole thing is messed up. In relation to culture, I always say, white is not a color. It's an attitude. Black folks, we don't appreciate ourselves. Look here. Anytime an oppressor says, if you have one 30-second Negro blood, one 30-second Negro blood, you're a nigger. I say, wait a minute. Think about that now. This is my enemy. This is a guy who hates me and will do anything to keep me down. 
So what he is saying is that in order to equal one of me, you've got to put 32 white boys next to me. But black folks don't hear it that way. We hear the negative part of that statement. I mean, if you have a dollar bill in order to equal that dollar in pennies, you have to have a hundred of those little things. It's the same with white folks and black folks. We're powerful, creative, and often ingenuous. Unfortunately, there are only a handful of us who believe in our greatness. I'm not saying that the other people are not exceptional. I'm saying that we are too. Again, we're all from the same stardust. If black people believe in ourselves and not what people say about us, we will be leading a discussion on race relations rather than reacting to it. In fact, we can make the world realize how ridiculous racism is. For example, when I participated in civil rights marches, many times whites would attack us with dogs and fire, and fire hoses. At some point later, I'd have to laugh at about the situation. Think about it. These folks were so angry that they were acting stone cold crazy, frothing out the mouth, chasing blacks with dogs spitting on us. And angry about what? Racism makes no sense. Whites hate blacks just because of the color of our skin. Any rational person knows that we can't control the color of our skin. But it's not our skin. It's who we are that makes them lose their minds. Or maybe it's seeing our faces, the atrocities they committed in our shared past. Or maybe it's seeing in our faces the atrocities they've committed in our shared past. So now, you look at this mess we're in. This racist mess that came about because we're not thinking. Slavery has messed up our minds in countless ways. For instance, a black woman is the only woman on the planet who goes to a place called a beauty parlor. All of the women go to a hair salon. But our women have been convinced that they are not attractive. They're in, they're in the beauty parlor spending good money for what God already gave them. Hair, nails, lashes. I'm here to say God made everybody. And did God make ugly people? See, as a robot didn't give me nappy hair. The same universe that put the sun, the moon, the stars gave me nappy hair. But then the white boy comes in and starts praising his def definition of beauty in the media. And we believe it. If I were, if, if I was here a billion years before you, then don't tell me that stuff you're using ain't mine. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, free black people made us citizens and gave black men the right to vote, although they prevented us from doing so. The white woman didn't get the right to vote till 1921. Now, that white woman was the white boy's mama, but he could not let her vote. That was his mama. That was his daughter. That was his wife. That was his girlfriend. Anyway, we keep looking up to the white man saying to ourselves, oh, I'd like to be like him. For so many of us, our minds are so messed up that we want to be like him, even though it does not make cultural sense. Meanwhile, he's trying to be like us, except we don't know it because he's trying to keep us from seeing what he he's doing. People say, well, I don't know why these white folks are lying in the sun trying to get a suntan. Man, hear what he's saying. A suntan, not a sun black. I was doing some research and found an article that said about 80% of the coral reefs have been destroyed by suntan lotion. They've been, they, they've been there trillions of years, and if suntan lotion does that to coral reef, what do you think is doing to people? The universe will pay your ass back. A white man may not say he's trying to be like us, but look what he's doing. A rose by any other mean. See what I'm saying? We don't appreciate ourselves. We don't appreciate what it means to go through what black people have been going through and still be here. Think about being under stress all the time and what the, that does to your body, the adrenaline rush and all the other phys physiological stuff. Did you ever walk down the street and see a cat turn the corner and come up on a dog? Ever see that happen to the cat's body? It goes straight up. That's the response that God gave it. Fight or flight. Hair sticks up, shoots out every which way. Like the Big Bang in the universe that made that's we're, we're, we're made of fur. It's the same with humans and adrenaline. Your eyes suddenly can see 40 miles away. The fastest animal out there, can you can outrun it. You have the energy of you and somebody else too. Now that's meant to happen for just a few minutes until you're out of danger. That's fight or flight response wasn't meant to exist 24 hours a day, every day, but when something that's supposed to last a few minutes happens to you all the time, how do you think that will how do you think that will mess you up? Why do you think black folks have high blood pressure so bad that that uh, that important runs? It's a genetic response to the oppression we've been dealing with for 400 years, passed down from one generation to the next. 
If I were to leave home and go to work knowing a racist was there, I would start getting scared. But I can't quit my job. Now, that's not a problem just for black folks, but most, but most other folks can't quit their jobs either. They've got mortgages to pay. They've got children to send to college. Financial worries are the same with black folks, except we also have to be worried about racism too. I have to go to work. I have to take care of this, take care of that, just like white folks. But with all the pressure I feel, that fight or flight response that suppresses fear and rage, it changes the whole body chemistry. When I leave work and yell at my wife or children, it's not because I'm mad at them. I'm mad at the boss man. But it would cost me my job to say something to him. If I haul off and slap him upside the head, the rest of the Negroes say, nigga must be crazy. He, know, he knew he was going to get fired. That's why when black folks go to church, our music has got to be loud. Go to a white Catholic church, they're not hollering. Our music has got to be loud just so we can forget the boss man in the week we just had, so we can have a little bit of peace. We got to unmess up our minds from what we've been through. We use the music to clear our heads and we move our bodies and dance to shake off the excess stress. So if the white boy thinks it's 32 of him to equal one of me, that's why. As I said, we don't appreciate ourselves. We believe what other folks say about us. The purpose of this book is to spread the knowledge, to get the world thinking again and to see what is truly there and not just take what we are told is truth. When I was a little boy, maybe my mama didn't read that well, but we had every encyclopedia you could find. I would blow the dust off of them and read a volume every now and again. Valuing information is something I have passed on to my children. Most of us do that. But keep in mind, your children don't hear what you mean. They hear what you say. So when you teach your black children, you've got to work twice as hard as a white child. They hear you saying they're dumb. One day, my then eight-year-old son, Christian, said to his mother, I want to tell you something, but I don't, but don't tell dad. I was out for recess and I forgot I left something behind and went back into the school to get it. I overheard a white teacher say, Christian's so dumb, something sometimes I think he is not a Gregory. When I came home that night, Lily and my wife told me about the situation. I went in to see Christian. Dad, am I as dumb as they say? He asked me. I said, you are you are a dumb little boy. That's what you are. Your mama won't tell you that. Okay. But I'll tell you because you are. And I'll tell you because the difference between A's and D's has nothing got nothing to do with smartness. It's discipline. That's all. And your sister Michelle, my advice is to follow her around everywhere she goes and do what she does. One day when Christian was 13 years old, I was running through the house getting ready to go out. And he stopped me and said, how did you know if I started following Michelle, I start making straight A's? And I said, the difference between an A and an F is discipline. And your sister is the most disciplined person I know. Today, Christian is a doctor. It's true. I did not have any issues with my daughters when it came to education. Most boys spend time playing. Girls make better grades because they're in the house studying. For the most part, that's the way black girls are raised, to stay in the house. One day, my daughter, Michelle, came to me and said, well, now, since you made me go to this white school, I'm fixing to go to grad school. Where should I go? Since she was acting so high and mighty, I said, go to the London School of Economics. She did not even know it existed when I mentioned it. But a few months later, she came to me with an acceptance letter. Today, she was the only PhD in sexual harassment in the workplace on the whole planet. She comes in and testifies against you as an expert witness. That's it. You're going down because she's the authority on the subject. We get to the serious trouble by not valuing education and learning. Did you know that 98% of the children who drown in the summertime are black? Why? Because historically, we weren't allowed in swimming pools because of Jim Crow. The law put a bad taste in black folks' mouths, and to this day, I don't know how to swim. On my family's farm, there was a lake a thousand feet deep. I told her, if one of our kids starts to drown, you go get them. I'm not going in that water. I can't swim, and I'm not going to play like I'm swimming. And when I was home, the kids were out in the water playing. I would leave the house. I didn't even want to hear them call my name when they were near the water. Dick Gregory, something else. Everybody knows we were at one time enslaved. But many of us think that we're supposed to be slaves and act like we believe it, too. Look here. When Africans were brought to the Americans, Americas, we didn't believe become slaves until we got here. If you jumped off the ship, you weren't a slave. You were a person who had been kidnapped. You didn't pick cotton on the way out over here. It's not in your nature to be a slave. These people we're dealing with didn't raid a country. They raided a whole continent. I'm from a whole continent, a continent made up of tribes of war with one another. The Oyos didn't like the, de the homies who didn't like the so-and-so, who didn't like the so-and-sos. We black folks had spears, and for a thousand years, we were throwing them at one another. 
in that way, we were like people in Europe who are also fighting one another, although they use different weapons. Europe is a continent. Almost every single one of the countries and of that kind have fought every last one of the others. They didn't have to fight Asia. They were too busy fighting each other all over the continent. Now, in slavery times, black folks were put on ships in the West Africa. That very same spot where the slaves were put on ships is where hurricanes start. Most hurricanes start in West Africa and follow the same trail that the slave ships follow. There is no record of a hurricane hitting America before that. If you don't believe me, look it up. The first Africans were brought to America as slaves in 1619. The first hurricane slammed into this place in 1635. I say a hurricane in the spirit of a black woman. That's why it starts with her. <laughs> no slave was official was offloaded until the ships got to the Caribbean. Hurricanes stay well, stay below water until they get all the way to the Caribbean. They will hit the United States and come up the East Coast all the way to Maine. Now, Canada is as close to Maine as a car is to the curb, but Canada doesn't have hurricanes half as bad as we have. Why not? Because Canada never messed with a black woman like we did, although they did have slaves. That black sister, she's the only person on this planet who can take a butter knife and cut your ties to the trim. And everybody says, wait a minute, a butter knife? Better believe it, man. That is who she is. That's who we are. That's that spirit. That's power. Other folks see it, but we don't. Here's another indication of our power in the universe. Prior to the middle passage, sharks had a natural migration. They swarm in this particular pattern for hundreds of years. Then the middle passage comes along. All that blood in the ocean, the blood of millions of black people, the sharks changed their migration patterns to follow the blood. The sharks changed their migration patterns to follow the blood. They continue to swim along that same route today. Slavery was wrong on so many levels that it changed the world in ways we do not even recognize. That's our power. You know what you can do? Learn what black folks have already done and understand how smart and tough you need to be to survive back then and now. Black folks are superheroes. We can be invisible when we have to be. Think about your mama's mama. Maybe she was a maid for white folks. Now, how many times have you been in a cab and started talking to a friend like the cab driver can't hear a thing? It was the same with your mama's mama, listening to white folks who forgot she was in the room. It was the same thing when the black folks worked at the hospital where they took Martin Luther King Jr. after he was shot on the balcony in Memphis. When they took him to the hospital, he was still alive which is what the black people who worked there at the time told me. They said that as he lay on that gurney, King was spat on and then smothered to death. Our invisibility is part of our survival. We can even transform into cowboys, despite the fact that there are no evidence of a black cowboy back when I used to watch TV, cowboys on TV. We got so we knew white folks. We had to just to survive. Now it's time to know ourselves. It's time to value ourselves. Give you one example. I can't understand how Negroes, with all the humiliation being been through, would join a black group or fraternity that would paddle their asses. We come from a history of humiliation. The white mob that was ready to do all kinds of crazy stuff to you and me, the folks in that mob didn't paddle one another's asses so they could be in the mob. So why would you do that to somebody who looks like you? And why would you up and volunteer to have somebody do that to you? The thing is, you go outside this messed up country, everybody else in this messed up world thinks that we're beautiful. Check this out. I used to go to Russia all the time. I took my wife, Lil, with me once. The subways in Russia go three miles down, so far down in the earth, you think you're about to come out the other side and clean. They're cleaner than any hospital you've got in America, at any restaurant. Cleaner than anything you ever saw over here. Anyway, we're on the subway and people are looking at Lil. One of them comes up and straight stares right at her. And Lil looks at me and says, 30 million Russians ride the subway every day in Moscow. They're not doing this to one another. I can't believe you let these white folks do this, do me like this. And I said, yeah, the day I stand up for your honor, it won't be around 30 million Russians. These odds, the odds got to be a little better than that. Now I thought of something. I said, I've been coming over here five years and they ain't never looked at me like that. And I figured it out. I said, I, I said the Russians have, have had seen black American men. All over the world are soldiers, but have never seen a black woman. And now they know how beautiful you are. That's why they're looking at the way a child looks at a Christmas toy. That's who you are. I can see it because the white racist system told me that you ain't nothing beautiful. I can't see it because they told me your skin was too black and your hair was too nappy. Beauty 
It's what the real world sees when they look at a black woman. It's what it sees when it looks at Lil. It's what it sees when it looks at Michelle Obama or Halle Berry or Fannie Lou Hamer. Don't let, the, don't let me get started on fine women. Beauty, that's what the real world sees. I don't see it, I told Lil, because these white folks done told me how ugly you are with the big lips and big nose and all that. Think about that now. For almost 50 years, the Russian people stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with the United States of America in a Cold War. That's how tough and smart those people were. You hear me? They're, and they're staring at my wife because she's beautiful. So that's the whole game of it. They see what we black folks don't see, what we need to start seeing. Know who you are. Value who you are. Knowing yourself and valuing yourself comes from knowing what's true and accurate. I went to Iran in the 1970s when the Ayatollah Khomeini was in charge, kicking America's ass. He sent a secretary, a man, to tell me that I had to leave the country that weekend because Iran had word they'd been going to be hit by a surprise attack from Iraq. Before I left, Khomeini sent me a long letter thanking me for being there. He wrote, you are beautiful. You are beautiful, Uncle Tom. I had enough sense to know that the admiration he had for me was real. It was due to my own ignorance that I didn't know who Uncle Tom really was. One brother would call another one Uncle Tom. Like it's the worst insult he could pull up out of pull out of his whole nappy head, not realizing that the original Uncle Tom was a hero who defied his master. Don't believe me? Go read the book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uncle Tom was based on a real person, Josiah Henson. He rescued 118 black folks from slavery. I remember when I was a little boy, I heard the old black folks say there are some people in Africa that white folks ain't never mess with. And they're not going to mess with because they control everything. They said those people are the Uncle Toms, the shapeshifters. I just thought that meant that black folks could get real mean. Not that they could change into gorillas or elephants or something crazy like that. But in a way, shapeshifters are what we are or what we are because black folks make ourselves into whatever we need to be to survive. Think about Napoleon. That short little French dude set out to conquer the world and damn near did it too. He had the single greatest military capability in the history of the planet at that time. Had all of Europe trembling while he conquered territory right and left. Then he went to, went to the Americas. That was the first time that little dude messed up because it was the first time he messed with black folks. The black general Toussaint Leo Vature. Now, that was one smart man, had already led a slave revolt and taken over the French colony in St. Domingue, which is now Haiti. Napoleon decided he wanted the land, the land back. He and his gang managed to trick Toussaint Louverture, who died in the French prison. But the rest of the black folks there gave the French troops just a fit that Napoleon finally said, later for this, we're out of here. Except it sounded nicer than that because he said it in French, and he left. Pulled out of the America, signed the Louisiana Purchase, and went the hell back to France and didn't look back. All because of what happened when he decided to mess with black people. You hear what I'm saying? Trying to say? That's the power we have when we're together. When we do what we need to do. That's why we need to celebrate ourselves. Everybody put in the comments on celebrate our, myself. Celebrate ourselves. We did that by ourselves. Nobody gave Toussaint Louverture and his soldiers any help. Many folks think all that all black black blacks live off the system, but most of the time we keep surviving without anybody or anything except ourselves. Look at when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president during the Great Depression. Roosevelt said, "Let's create the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, which is meant to put white folks to work so they could earn a decent living." So now here's a white boy at the WPA digging a hole that doesn't need to be dug. His brother comes along that even that evening and fills it back up. Anyway, black folks weren't included. Yet we praised Roosevelt. Black folks didn't get included in Social Security either. Not the way it worked then, at least. Social Security initially didn't cover farmers and domestics, which is what 99% of black folks were at the time. Consequently, now, all these black folks are out of work. How are we going to deal with it? We survive. You doing for me, me doing for you. Maybe I don't have the money to pay for fixing my roof, but here are some jars of peaches. Or let me watch your children while you go to work. That's who I am. That's who you are. That's how we got by. In the history of the planet, nobody else went through what we as black people have been through and survived. That takes strength. It takes smarts. It takes spirit. And other people see it, even the ones who don't want to admit it. That's why white folks have, have us take care of their children. 
Yes, half the time we raise their damn children for them. That's what they see. That's what they see in me that I don't see in me, that Holy Spirit. And then they try to tell me that I ain't nothing. They know, consider this a minute. What German would hire a Jew to take care of his house? He'd sooner burn it to the ground. And I don't know a single black person who would hire a white person to take care of their child. But white folks go all over the world and leave my mama back there to feed their children and take care of them, dress them for school. That's what I'm trying to say. If you miss that, do you miss who we are? We feed them, take care of them. They're not dealing with slaves. They're dealing with people with no bitterness at all. That is who I am. Not just some slave they brought over. The sooner we understand that, what we are made of, the better off we'll be. In this book, I'm offering information on a variety of subjects and personalities that have, been, that have influenced the world in a special way. Most of the stories come to me from my having been there. I marched in Selma during the civil rights movement, organized students rallies to protest the Vietnam War, sat in rallies for Native Americans and feminist rights and fought apartheid in South Africa. I've also been to some incredible places and met some amazing leaders along the way. I used to hang out with Congressman Adam Clayton Powell Jr. in, Bur in Bimini. In Bimini, they have no hotels, no buildings, just one bar, and that's a mile long. All the big folks from all over the world went there on their planes or yachts and drank all day. The playwright, Tennessee Williams, the writer, Ernest Hemingway, the actress, Judy Garland, and more. That's where they used to hang out. When I, get, when I, when I went there with Adam, man, I could not believe it. They love Adam there. I mean, wow, man, just the number one preacher in New York. I've been to see the Taj Mahal and the rest of that stuff in India. When I came back, people asked me, Greg, Greg, tell me, what was it like? I said, I'm going to disappoint you, baby. But what I found out when I got there is the way I used to feel at home when I had five caramels in a pocket, six in the other, and a pocket full of marbles. It's a kind of place where if you don't bring it with you, it won't be there when you get there. In 1968, I did a film with the writer James Baldwin, Baldwin's nigger. Baldwin was so brilliant. I just sit. I would just sit and laugh and talk with him for long periods of time. He was like something God had just fed out. It was like God told him, you go down there, you'll have some problems, but just keep doing it. A thousand years from now, they'll still be reading what Baldwin wrote, and it, and it, it, and it will still be relevant then. But this writing, his writing doesn't let you know what a funny man he was. In addition to these incredible experiences, I've also been to jail. Anybody trying to change a country for the better or by simply being a black man on a sunny day is usually arrested. Part for par for the course. I went to jail on nine counts for nine months total for protesting. Jail is not pleasant under any circumstance, but I tried to make the best of it. They put me off in a private room because they knew I might stir up trouble, another protest or something right inside the jail. There were bunk beds in my room. I took the bottom bunk and attached my book of, on meditation to the bunk above me to allow me to read hands-free. There's not a lot to do in jail, so I meditated for a long while. Next thing I knew, I heard a knocking sound. It was my head hitting the top bunk. I must have been going at it a while because there was blood on my forehead. After my body returned to the mattress, I said, oh, that's what meditation is about, levitation. So, several people witnessed my levitation. It's the fastest way to get out of jail. I'll tell you that. Self-knowledge and cultural pride can also give you a feeling of levitation. Whew. Dick Gregory writes very interesting. He is like kind of all over the place, it seems like. But uh, this brother has uh, has experienced a lot in his 80-some-odd years of his life. And I felt it was appropriate uh, to show some respect by reading his book. So... That's what we're doing. Uh, going through again, we've got three books we'll be going through during this period. Uh, our Black History series. Um, uh, we just got through reading an introduction to defining moments in history, reading between the lives by Mr. Dick Gregory. Uh, we'll also pick up an inventor of the day uh, uh, for our series, which will be African American inventions that changed the world, written by Mr. Michael Carson. And we'll also get into social construct, which is a book written by Mr. Dr. Claude Anderson called A Black History Reader. 101 questions you never thought to ask. So it'll be a three-part um, session when we meet for the book club. Uh, one, to get our invention. Two, to get our question and question answered. And then three, uh, to go through our main text, which will be uh, the book written by Mr. Doctor, uh, Mr. Dick Gregory. So whew, those were the uh, the introductions and a little bit of uh, of some of the uh, snippets of what we'll be reading. What you guys? Uh, what you guys think, man? You guys think this is gonna be enjoyable? Hopefully, you're, you're interested in, in, in getting some history. 
uh, I, real history from real people who went through it, not just uh, you know what was learned in our in our in our formal education, but maybe getting some real insight from people who actually experienced. And I think that would be uh, very valuable as we appreciate um, uh, Black History Month. Although we know Black history is a part of American history, I still think there's a uh, there's a this is a time to really focus and 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 and, and dive into it. So why not utilize it? I, I've rarely, I don't think in my lifetime, I've seen a focus on true black history during Black History Month. Um, yeah, we have the norms, but there's so much more to us. Uh, and obviously can't be all captured into one month. But I think this will be a good deep dive into, into our history uh, to learn from it, to know that we created stuff, to understand the system of the society that we live in, and to uh, get real... Uh, you know, firsthand experience from someone who's 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 met all the people and gone through all the stuff. So that's what we'll be going through, man. New Black Wall Street Book Club. Hope you guys enjoy it. what's going on. What's going on, Felicia? Good stuff. Kiana, what's up with you? Celebrate myself. Absolutely. So make sure you guys check out ERGJ TV, which will be on Facebook. Uh, we'll be here on ERGJ Enterprises for the rest of the week, but eventually we'll start moving our content there. So if you want to uh, follow us for the book club or anything else, make sure you follow us there. This. It's New Black Wall Street Book Club, where black folk do read. Uh, if you put in a book, we absolutely will find it. I'm your host, ERGJ, Certified Financial Educator. I want you guys to remember this, that it takes a village. It starts with us. Let's build as we climb together. We all we got, beautiful people. But thank God, I mean, really, thank God that that's more than enough. Until the next episode, you know what time it is. Mr. DJ, hit the music. New, new, new black, new. It's the new black Wall Street book club. Black Wall Street. With your host, Evan Jefferson. Evan Jefferson. It's time for us to go. Yeah. Now, you ain't got a little computer, but we encourage you to get out there and learn and apply all the things you learn at the new black Wall Street. Book club, book club. <laughs> yeah. New Black Wall Street. The New Black Wall Street. Book club.